So welcome back. My pleasure to introduce Supratik. Supratik is a professor here at IIT Bombay, so he is technically one of your hosts. And uh, Supratik is going to talk about knowledge uh, compilation for Boolean functional synthesis. But Supratik is a person, I think, if those of you who are looking to do a PhD in the area, I think uh, he should be your one of your prime candidates to uh, go and try to do a PhD with him. Right? So Pratik, I've given you a, a open invitation, you know, sort of open endorsement. Uh, of course, if you want to do it, if, if you don't want to do it with Supratik, please come and do it with me. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Sanjeeva, for the introduction. So, I'm going to talk about some recent work that that we have been doing on uh, Boolean functional synthesis. There is also a poster on this outside. So, let me try to quickly uh, sort of describe the problem and some of the results that we have. This is part of ongoing work and this is work with uh, Akshay uh, and Shetal are certainly here. I don't know if Krishna is here and uh, some of our students uh, Jatin and Divya who have since graduated. Okay. So, what is Boolean functional synthesis? So, you know Boolean functions are of course very important. We all know that. Uh, now, sometimes it is difficult to specify the behavior of a system uh, as a function and sometimes it is easier to specify it relationally. So, here is a uh, you know a, a sort of simple example that everybody can relate to that suppose I want to describe an arbiter which has two inputs uh, request inputs and two grant outputs and I want to specify how the ground grant output should be uh, you know what what is the behavior of the grant outputs in terms of the request inputs and it might be actually easier to specify it in this manner saying that as long as there is one of one you know as long as there is at least one request at least one grant should be high uh, both the grant should not be simultaneously high this is trying to arbitrate between two requests to a specific resource let us say and uh, if grant one is high then request one should have been high and if grant Two is high, then request two should have been high, and uh, so so if you look at the way I have described the behavior of the system over here, I am basically saying that I don't know what g1 is as a function of r1 and r2, I don't know what g2 as a function of r1 and r2, but I would like the system to behave in this way so that this is the relation between the inputs and outputs, and so this kind of specification is uh, also called relational specification, and this is. Uh, convenient to specify, but uh, you know once I give you the specification you still have to synthesize that arbiter. So, you have to get G1 and G2 in terms of R1 and R2 and uh, that is the problem that we want to address. So, we want to synthesize Boolean functions from a relational specification. Everything is Boolean here, there is no temporal aspect uh, and this problem we will call the Boolean functional synthesis problem. Okay. So, the formal definition is, so we are given some blue inputs and some red outputs and we are given a relation between the blue inputs and the red outputs and we want to synthesize some functions 1 f j for each output y j such that if you read this uh, thing it is saying for every value of the inputs if there exists a way of assigning values to the outputs such that the specification can be met then uh, these functions substituted for these outputs will also satisfy the specification. Okay, so, it, it would uh, you know one would normally think that this implication should be in one direction because if there is an output then I want the functions, but the implication in the other direction comes for free. I mean if you already have f1 to fm which satisfies this then of course, there exists y1 to y. So, it is an equivalence and these fj's are also called scolem functions in the literature. And this is one, one important point to note that it is possible that for some values of x1 to xn, there may not be any values for y1 to ym such that phi can be satisfied. Okay. But even in that case, even in you know such problem instances, uh, this makes sense because this is saying that for all those other values for which there exists y1 to ym, f1 to fm should be such that it satisfies the specification. For those x1 to xn for which there does not exist any y1 to ym, there is nothing that can be done. So, uh, even if uh, for some x1 to xn there is not anything such that which satisfies this, this problem still makes sense as long as there are some x1 to xn for which 
it makes sense to talk about some outputs, okay. So, so I, I want to make this uh, distinction clear because this does make a difference in some of the techniques and the technique that we are going to talk about uh, actually uh, works even in such cases, okay. So there are several applications of uh, Boolean functional synthesis. I will not go through all of them. I have just, you know, for the sake of time, I have just, you know, put up a long list and this is certainly not a comprehensive list. There are several other things. And there are kind of important applications like quantifier elimination, certifying solvers. Basically, if you give a quantified Boolean formula and if you want to know whether it is satisfiable or not, then you also need a certificate to show, you know, I mean, this morning we heard a lot about proofs. So these certificates form part of the proof for QBF. Uh, it's used for program synthesis, repair of circuits, programs, tons of things. Uh, and we are certainly not the only ones to work on this problem. In fact, uh, it looks like Boole worked on it, George Boole, uh, as early as 1847. And Lowenheim, you know, several of you might have studied about Lowenheim's Coulomb theorem. So, you know, so this has been basically looked at by stalwarts since long. Uh, there are, uh, I mean, of course, and they did come up with solutions which are very theoretical, which if you try to implement them, they don't scale in practice. Uh, there are uh, people who have tried to uh, say that, okay, let's look at this formula for all x exists y phi x y. And if this formula turns out to be valid, which means that for every x there is indeed a y, which is not always the case as I just mentioned. But if this formula turns out to be valid, we can then look at the proof of validity of that formula and from there we can extract uh, Skolem functions. So people have worked on that. Uh, templates, we have heard about templates a lot yesterday. Uh, that has also been used to generate Skolem functions. Uh, there are some function composition based approaches uh, which were tried, uh, you know, towards the beginning of the current resurgence and interest in this area. Uh, it turns out that this method is, you know, nice to learn, nice to study, but uh, if you have large number of uh, outputs to synthesize, this tends to uh, blow up. Uh, using binary decision diagrams, this has been tried and Rohr is here. Uh, he's, uh, he has also worked in this. And this, this scales for a class of benchmarks as long as we have good variable orders for BDDs, that's always the problem. If you don't have good variable orders, then there's performance degradation. Uh, recently, uh, there has been work on incremental determinization. Sanjit has worked on it. And uh, this also works well for a large class of inputs. Uh, and uh, in fact, this restriction was there earlier, but now it has been removed. So it now works even if for some x's there are no y's. Uh, and then there are uh, quantifier instantiation techniques. Uh, there is recently some work uh, that we did uh, along with Rohr and Moshe Varti and uh, Luca uh, Tabahara on input output separation and uh, some earlier work that we have done where we tried to come up with an informed estimate of what the Skolem function should look like and then we try to fix them iteratively. So the talk I'm going to talk about today is none of these. It's about a completely different approach. Uh, and uh, before we get into that, uh, let's try to understand what led us to, you know, even trying to get into this business of uh, knowledge compilation. So uh, last year, uh, in some work that uh, Akshay, Shetal, and I and a few students did, we tried to ask the question that how hard or easy is this problem? And uh, some results are, you know, fairly easy to see that if I give you a phi to p problem, uh, then uh, if I could synthesize Coulomb functions for these, I could just substitute them back into the formula and then invoke a Cohen p oracle and I would be able to solve this. So, so a, a Cohen p to the np problem or a phi to p problem uh, can be solved uh, if I had a solution, if I had something which which could solve the Boolean functional synthesis problem. So this is not really an oracle, but if, if it could, if it could give me the solution to this, I could use that to solve this problem. So at least we know that it's at least NP hard. It cannot be simpler than that. But then we also ask that, well, this NP hardness is really talking about the time, how much time can it take? Uh, but suppose I gave you all the time that you needed, 
how small can you get these colon functions? What is a lower bound on how small can these functions be? Uh, so in particular we are asking does there exist compact skolem functions although synthesizing may take any amount of time exponential or even beyond. Of course in exponential time we can synthesize. Uh, so of course when we are talking about this the first thing that comes to mind is that aren't there already lower bound results on circuit sizes. Uh, so it turns out that yes of course it's very seminal work on lower bound results on circuit sizes but they refer to monotone circuits. And we are not putting the restriction that the skolem functions that we synthesize have to be monotone and therefore these arguments do not really carry over here. So we have to use some other arguments to show to, to find lower bounds uh, for the skol lower bounds of the skolem functions you know as much time as you can take but how small can we get these functions okay. So this led us last year to sort of arrive at these results we were able to show that unless the polynomial hierarchy in complexity theory unless it collapses to the second level uh, there will exist relational specifications for which one cannot get skolem functions which are polynomial size they have to be super polynomial okay. Now does the polynomial hierarchy collapse to the second level you know, I certainly do not know that nobody knows that as of today uh, it, it is unlikely it is one of the long standing open questions but uh, if we say that that is unlikely then it this is also unlikely that we will get uh, polynomial sized skolem functions always. Uh, then we were also able to show that this is another uh, hypothesis in complexity theory the non-uniform exponential time hypothesis I will not go into the details of the hypothesis but unless this long standing hypothesis fails there exist specifications for which skolem functions must necessarily be exponential sized. Okay, so that is the bad news which basically means that efficient algorithms that, that always give us the answer in polynomial size are unlikely. Uh, but then the good news uh, that we also saw in that uh, we were able to show in the same paper is that if the specification is given in some, some kind of normal forms and we identified this one form uh, in that paper called weak decomposable negation normal form then it is indeed solvable in polynomial time and space. So what is this weak decomposable negation normal form you know very uh, at a very high level it means that if I can express the specification as a circuit such that if I take any literal and the negation of the literal and there are not two paths meeting up at an AND gate then that is called weak decomposable negation normal form. Uh, it turns out that every Boolean function can always be expressed in this form in weak decomposable negation <coughs> normal form but there might be an exponential blow up in the size okay. So this is what we uh, had last year and uh, this basically and you know we did a lot of experiments which showed that uh, interestingly that efficient synthesis was possible uh, not only when the specification was in this form but even when the specification was not in this form and that led us to ask something more interesting is going on I mean this is certainly not a strong characterization of when we can do efficient synthesis. So that led us to ask this questions that uh, is there a weaker representation form that guarantees polytime synthesis and uh, we came up with a positive answer to that that yes there is something weaker which is which we call the synthesis negation normal form uh, that guarantees polytime synthesis and not only that it actually subsumes and uh, is exponentially more succinct than several other uh, representation forms that are there in the literature. Then the next question we asked is that uh, given a specification f is it possible to simplify that specification and still solve the original problem and uh, this also we were able to answer affirmatively and using a notion of refinement that I will explain in the subsequent slides and finally can we algorithmically compiled f compile f to a refined sin nnf spec f prime uh, sin nnf would guarantee polynomial synthesis and refinement would ensure that whatever we are doing would still uh, solve the original problem even though the problem I might be solving is for a new problem for a refinement of the original. and this also we were able to show affirmatively. But of course given the lower bounds we know that uh, there is no escaping this I mean this somewhere we have to there are no free lunches somewhere we have to pay. Okay, so uh, so this led us to ask that basically can we do this compilation given a specification f can we compile it to a specific form which has some properties because after that then we can do everything efficiently. 
So uh, in the literature, uh, this, you know, this field of study is also called knowledge compilation and in particular this is Wikipedia's definition which says that uh, it's a family of techniques for addressing the intractability of a number of artificial intelligence problems. This is the specific reference to artificial intelligence. And a propositional model is compiled in an offline phase to support some you know, difficult queries in poly time once it's compiled. And so the, the only change that we do, so, so essentially the picture is this, that you take, take a propositional formula in whatever form, you compile it to a specific form uh, for these artificial intelligence problems. And after that, in poly time, you can answer some difficult questions like how many solutions had, were there to the original formula, was the original formula satisfiable, what are all the models of the original formula and so on. So, so this part is guaranteed poly time, this is the compiler and uh, in the AI context, uh, a lot of work has happened to convert, you know, formulas for example in CNF to formulas in DNNF, BDDs, whatever, there's a whole bunch of other things. So in our context, we, we just change the definition to say that, well, we are not talking about a specific artificial intelligence problem, although it can be applied to some AI problems, but we are talking about a synthesis problem. So the picture looks something like this, that you are given a specification in one of these forms and you are also told what are the inputs and outputs because that does matter. Just the Boolean formula is not sufficient. I need to know, I, I should synthesize what in terms of what. And then can I compile it down to uh, a normal form? So this is our synthesis normal form. So that after that in poly time, we can actually get the scolem functions, okay? So the, so the focus of this talk is really on this because after that everything is easy. Okay, so here is a quick uh, introduction and uh, I will certainly not be able to do justice to all, all that went into proving the results, but I, I hope to be able to at least convey the idea of what's going on. So suppose I'm given a specification phi on the inputs x and outputs y, and suppose I represent it as a negation normal form circuit, directed acyclic graph. So what is negation normal form? It is a circuit which has only AND and OR gates, all the NOT gates are at the leaves, okay? So for example, if here, if, if this is a, a Boolean function, then this is the negation normal form of this. This is already written in negation normal form. Uh, so that all the negations that appear are at the leaps. Beyond that, there are only AND and OR gates. Okay, so what we do is we say, okay, you give me a specification and I look at it in its negation normal form circuit or DAG and this is actually an easy translation. For example, if you give me any Boolean circuit, I can use De Morgan's law to push the negations down and this can be done in poly time. This is usually no problem. What we do next is we say that, okay, once I have this, I'm going to transform this a little bit and to get what we call a positive form of the specification. So in this positive form of the specification, I'll have the inputs, I'll have the outputs, and I'll have some, some additional stuff over here, uh, which, and as many of those as there are outputs, and these additional stuff are basically obtained by re replacing every negation yi leaf by a fresh variable yi bar. So for example, this was the formula we had earlier. So for ev every place where I have negation of an output, I'm going to introduce a yi bar, negation of an output yi bar. So in terms of the circuit, it just means that at these two places I had some negation y2 and negation y1. So I'm going to put y2 bar and y1 bar, okay? So because the NNF circuit could be obtained easily, this can also be obtained easily. And this is called positive uh, form of the formula and actually this is also not new. This has been studied in the literature, we found out later, although we sort of reinvented the wheel here. Now it turns out that this, uh, this positive form has some nice properties and I think it's best uh, represented through this picture. So if I take the formula phi and if I look at its positive form and let us say I want to existentially quantify out one of the output variables, y1, okay? So it turns out that if I take the positive form and set both y1 and y1 bar, remember the negation y1s have been replaced by fresh variables, so now I can assign them values independently. So if I replace both of them by zero, I always get an under approximation of this, and if I replace both of them by one, I always get an over approximation of this. And this is, not very deep, I mean, if you just look at how, you know, for this, basically I have, you know, if both are zero, then 
you know, I'm sort of saying that I might be, even cases where it might become true because this was set to one, I'm going to disallow those and here because both are one, even cases where this might become zero because one of them has to be zero, I'm sort of allowing those. So this is not very hard to see that I can actually obtain over and under approximations of existentially quantifying out one of the output variables by just setting constants to chosen leaves of this positive form. Now it turns out that we can do something more and, and in fact, for example, if I want to quantify out both the outputs, I just set all of them to zero and set all of them to one and I get upper and over approximations, under and over approximations. Now it turns out that if I start off with this positive form of the specification, I can actually try to sort of see whether this is going to be good for synthesis purposes and towards that end what we will do is we will start off with the positive form of the specification and we will start off with a linear ordering of the outputs. How we get this linear ordering is you will get a flavor of it in you know the next slide itself but let us not get into that you know that problem the optimal ordering finding the optimal ordering is indeed hard. Okay. So what I am going to do is I am going to say okay let, let me take this positive form and let me fix y1 till y i minus 1 and y1 bar till y i minus 1 bar all to ones. Okay, this is kind of the same trick that I showed in the earlier slide where I want to set a variable and its negation now renamed to the same value. And uh, these other things y i plus 1 to y m and y, y i negation y i plus 1 to negation y m. So these overline these bar variables I am just setting to the negation of this. So if I take this positive form and if I do this transformation, I will get a formula in terms of the x's, in terms of y i, y i bar and in terms of y i plus 1 to y m. So now we ask that does there exist any value of x1 to xn and y i plus 1 to y m which makes this positive form semantically equivalent to y i and y i bar. So the reason why we are asking this question are all technical details in the paper. But as you can see, this is just a query to a SAT solver, nothing more than that. I am asking does there exist any assignment of these values which will make this positive form equivalent to y i and y i bar. Remember y i bar is not the same as negation y i, it is a renamed variable. Whereas all the other things here I have kept the negation of these and these things here have assigned the same value to this. So essentially we are asking can you know can this formula be made to behave like y i and y i bar and if the answer is no, if we cannot make it behave like y i and y i bar for all i in 1 to n, then we say that this formula is in sin nnf. In fact, this phi hat then is good enough for polytime synthesis okay, and I will just show you how that happens. So here is a simple example to, to sort of illustrate that complicated definition. So here is a formula on some inputs and outputs, here it is actually a CNF formula, here is the circuit representation and note that this is you know for, for those who are aware of what DNNF is, this is not in DNNF because you have an AND gate and you have things like Y2 and negation Y2 going and meeting up there. Uh, it is not in weak DNNF also for the same reason Y2 and negation Y2 can go and meet up there. So this, this is not one of the forms that you know we had studied earlier. But now let us say I fix this output ordering. So let us say you know this is a linear ordering, I fix this linear ordering and then I want to ask that well can I make this behave like y1 and y1 bar? Is there a way that I can assign values to the other things so that I can make it behave like y1 and y1 bar? Clearly no because there is no y1 bar here at all, right? So the answer is I cannot make it behave like y1 and y1 bar so that is good news. So then I ask that can I make it behave like y2 and y2 bar after changing this to y2 bar but before asking the question I am allowed to set y1 and y1 bar to ones. Okay? That is what we had said here, I am allowed to set these to ones. So it is not the same as just asking can I make this uh, behave like y2 and y2 bar, I am asking that after I have set y1 and there is no y1 bar here, after I have set it to 1 can I now make it behave like y2 and y2 bar and it turns out that I cannot because that one here blocks off this y2, it does not let that y2 reach that AND gate. 
So therefore, this is in sin and if with respect to this ordering. Uh, if I flip the ordering, is it still in sin and if? So here I am asking, can I make it behave like y2 and y2 bar first? And sure, I can. Uh, so it is not in sin and if with respect to this ordering. So it's a fairly delicate notion. The same structure for a certain ordering can be in sin and if, may not be in sin and if. And remember the result that I said earlier, once we know it is in sin and if, we have polytime synthesis. So this ordering does matter when we are doing the synthesis, okay. So here are some relations to other data structures, other representations we know. For example, if this is a binary decision diagram, then actually it can be converted in linear time to something which is sin NNF. Basically every node in the BDD needs to be replaced by the structure and here you see y1 bar don't ever go and meet up at an AND gate. They always go and meet up at an OR gate, okay. So every BDD can be converted in linear time to a sin NNF which means that if you can just construct a BDD for your specification that is it, you are done, you have polytime synthesis, yeah. So, you were saying that the property of the formal BDC and NNF is also dependent on the quality the structure. It does not depend on the order of variables in the BDD for example, it could be a BDD with any arbitrary order. But once you have, so you know for a BDD, for every possible ordering of the variables it is in sin NNF. For every possible ordering of the variables in the sin NNF definition. But of course, when you are constructing the BDD, you have to come up with some order. So here you come up with any order, does not have to be input first, input last, whatever. Any order which works, I can immediately convert it to this and here you can see that no variable and its negation will ever go and meet up at an AND gate. So it does not matter what order you chose for the sin NNF definition, they will for every possible order. So if you start from a BDD and construct this circuit in linear time for every possible output ordering it should sin NNF, okay. So this relaxes the freedom of what ordering I can use to construct this BDD, it does not have to be input first, right. Uh, so DNNF is of course, you know, it's very widely studied in the AI literature, decomposable negation normal form. So it says that for every AND gate that you have in the circuit representation, uh, the leaves here and the leaves on the the leaves at the bottom of the two uh, subtrees rooted at the two children of that AND gate, uh, they must be completely disjoint, right. So, so if z, z appears here, where z is either an input or output or whatever, then neither z nor negation z can appear here. So this is DNNF. So of course, if it is in DNNF, it is certainly in sin NNF. Weak DNNF said that, well, okay, if y appears here, then y bar should not appear here. So of course, if it is in weak DNNF, then certainly in sin NNF. But sin NNF is, even, even if y and y bar have, you know, I mean, for example, if x and negation x have a path to something, it does not matter. I mean, I, I showed that example where y2 and y2 bar actually go and meet up in an AND gate, but still it is in sin NNF because you are allowed to fix the values of some of the other variables earlier. All right. So, uh, so DNNF, WDNNF are already in sin NNF. So, uh, so, it, so it looked like sin NNF has kind of generalized a few of the earlier things and then we asked this question that did it really generalize or are these only a few cases? Could it be the case that in some case sin NNF becomes larger than these other representations? And then we had these results which basically said that there exist polynomial size sin NNF specifications uh, that can be expressed using BDDs only in exponential size using DDNNF only in exponential size, a super polynomial size unless once again some complexity theory conjecture gets falsified and so on. Uh, but it, it is also true that there are representations for which you can get NNF representations, just plain vanilla NNF which are polynomial sized but the sin NNF representation can be super polynomial and once again this is coming out from the lower bound that we have, I mean we cannot escape this. Okay, so, so this is kind of the ordering that we have, NNFs are the most compact that we know, then we have sin NNF which are strictly uh, more succinct than WDNNF which is strictly more succinct than D DNNF, uh, this is uh, deterministic decomposable negation normal form and then BDDs. So BDDs are really at the far extreme end whereas these are uh, you know almost at the other end. Okay, so how does sin NNF help Skolem function synthesis? So here is a template for one, once you have this thing in sin NNF, remember you will have some, I think the colors got interchanged, the output should be red and the 
uh, input should have been blue. But once you have the specification in SynNNF, all you do is, you know, the, the first thing you do is you set all of them except the last one to once. So here in this case, there are two outputs. So I'll set y1 and y1 bar to one, and y2 and y2 bar, the last output to one zero. And this guarantees that I'll get a scolim function for uh, y1, for y2, okay? And once I have the scolim function for y2, I can then take another copy of this, and now at y2, I can feed this already. So this dotted line means feeding y2, this dotted line means feeding negation of y2, y2 and negation of y2, and then I do the same thing. So for all output variables except the last one, I'm going to set the output and its bar both to one, and the last output, I'll set it to one and zero, and then I get this column function for the next variable, and I can just keep continuing doing this. So it's not hard to see that if you do this, uh, you, you can basically now get all the scolem functions that you wanted in how much size, as many outputs. In the worst case, you'll have to replicate it that many times. So m times the size of the specification. And uh, how many additional wires do you need? So here, you know, this guy needs to go not only to the next one, but to the one after that, to the one after that. So it's like, you know, the the, Output from this needs to go to m minus one, the output from this needs to go to m and so on. So there are order m squared additional wires. So everything is poly time. Poly time and poly space, because that was the main question we were trying to ask, that can we make it polynomial sized? Okay, now, uh, so, so that is good. So that I think is the, uh, you know, gist of what sin and f is. And then there is this other question that we wanted to ask is that, is it possible to simplify the specification and still get an answer to the original question. And so here uh, I have pictorially represented it in this form. So suppose I'm given the specification phi of x, y, and let us say this blue region represents all those values of x for which actually there exists a y such that phi of x, y is true. And let us say this represents the space of all scolem functions that I could have substituted. So once again, this x should have been blue. The, sca the space of all scolem functions for y. So every point within this space is a scolem function for y that I could use, and every point within this space is a valuation of x for which there exists a y. So if I'm given a spec, and if this is the view with respect to the valuations of x and the possible scolem functions, uh, we are saying that, well, uh, can I get another spec, phi tilde, which may expand this, it's not required to be the same as this, but can only shrink this, right? So what is this saying? It's saying that every scolem function of, for phi tilde is also going to be a scolem function for phi, and the scolem function for phi tilde may actually, the, this specification uh, may be satisfiable in a larger range for a larger subset of inputs than the original specification. So if I can find a phi tilde which does this, you know, expanding, possibly expanding this, and possibly shrinking this, then I'll call that a refinement with, with respect to synthesis of phi. And uh, in this case, we can just solve the problem for phi tilde and that will be a solution of the original problem. Uh, it turns out that uh, if I don't allow this to expand beyond the set of x's and I say that, well, phi tilde must also evaluate to uh, the values of x for which phi tilde uh, x, y, can be made true is the same as the values of x for which phi could be made true, but this has possibly shrunk. So that's called a stronger refinement. Uh, and it turns out that these notions are very useful. And in particular, we have this lemma which says that uh, if I have a specification which refines another specification, then every scolem function that I synthesize for this specification is also a scolem function for the other specification. Uh, and the same is true even for strong refinement. So here is a simple example. Uh, this might be by original specification, looks quite big. Uh, this specification can be shown to satisfy the properties I just showed uh, relative to this. And so this is a refinement with respect to synthesis of this. And so it's perfectly fine to synthesize the scolem functions from here. And if you look at it, you can just set y1 to 1 and y2 to 1 and you're done. So setting y1 to 1 and y2 to 1 also implements this specification. You can see that each clause turns out to be true. Okay, so we put it all together in a tool uh, which uh, takes in a specification in CNF or and inverter graphs and it outputs a refined phi 
tilde which is already in sin and nf. Uh, it uses some kind of branching. I think uh, Mate told a lot today about how branching is done. You know, similar techniques are used, heuristics are used. It aggressively tries to refine wherever possible because refinement can only simplify things for us. Uh, and the details are in the paper. And uh, I'll just maybe go to this last slide saying that, uh, you know, we need not look at that. So if you just look at these plots, we tried to compare the time taken by C2SYN, which is the tool that we have, with a BDD compiler, which takes a specification, compiles it down to a BDD, because once it's a BDD, it's a BDD we know it's simple after that. But C2SYN is not necessarily BDD. We tried to compare it with KDET, which is the incremental determination based tool, which is, I think, the best tool that we have today. And some earlier work that we did, BFSS, I know Kuldeep has recently uh, come up with another work. We didn't have it when we did this comparison. So, but he, he has a comparison of that in the poster. Uh, and so the, the picture here is, and these are different kinds of benchmarks uh, from the QBF eval suit and also from some factorization benchmarks. Uh, so I think the, the story here is that uh, I think no one method is better than the other methods and which, which is what is to be expected for hard problems. But, you know, there, there are clearly methods where, uh, there are clearly problem instances where the other methods seem to fail. I mean, they are timing out here, whereas uh, this going through the SYN and NF compilation step works, uh, whereas going through the SYN and NF compilation step also fails in some cases where the other things work. So I think this is just to be thought of as another technique in the portfolio of techniques of Boolean functional synthesis. The nice part about it is that we can now give some formal guarantees that it is polynomial time and size in terms of the synonym representation and anything that we can do to improve the compilation to synonym can only help in this process. Being fully cognizant of the fact that there are super polynomial lower bounds lurking in there, so we will not be able to go uh, polynomial unless some complexity conjectures as falsified. I'll stop there and take any questions. Uh, how do you order your Y and what happens if you oh. order it doesn't lead to anything? Do you backtrack try it, uh, another one or? Do we backtrack and find so, another order? Uh, yes. Uh, no, actually finding the best order is something that we haven't solved so far. But what we do is the following. So. Uh, so, so the algorithm, what it does is it takes a CNF formula and yeah. then it says that these are the output variables which I have to eventually ensure that this property holds. And then it asks which is the output variable that you would have split on if you are trying to solve, let's say, a satisfiability question. So we look okay. at the VSID score, for example, okay. for the output variables and then we say, okay, let's branch on this output variable. Because the moment we branch, we, we basically have an if-then-else kind of structure. And then we know that that variable is taken care of. And the residues are themselves simplified. And then we go ahead and ask, can we... So, so the first thing we do is we, we ask, can we refine this yeah. to sort of simplify it further? Yeah, because you, you show an example, of, depending on the order, you find yes. something or not. This one, this one, yeah. So yeah. it happens that in your case, you may use the wrong order and you, you will not succeed, right? No, no, no. If I use the wrong order, I'll just become a bigger synonym. I will always succeed. It's like I'm branching, okay. right? Okay. So every time I choose a variable and branch on it, I'm basically creating an if-then-else structure. And the moment I create an if-then-else structure, uh, it is, yeah, so it's basically this. Okay, so this so, always satisfies synonym. The okay. question is, did I branch on the right variable first? Yeah, no, because I th you had another example where you, you show that it, uh, the fact that you are a CNNF depends on the order. Yeah, this specific structure is yes. not in synonym with respect to this order. Yes. But now if I want to convert it to synonym with respect to this order, I'll just split on Y2 first. So I'll get a different structure. That okay. structure will be bigger than this structure. And then that will be in synonym, right? Okay. And for example, if I split with respect to y2, I'll get y2 and whatever, something, or okay. negation y2 and something. So that structure, which is not the same as this, this does not have the form of y2 and something or negation y2 and something. That structure is already in synonym because, because of this, that, you know, y and negation y can never go and meet up. So okay. 
any order will always mm -hmm. give you a sin in an F. Okay. Is it giving you something which is small? So, so this is the usual question, how do we okay. choose a variable order? Okay. Thanks, Supriti. Oh, okay.